The webinar is hosted by Team Sweden, and Team Sweden means it's the business Sweden located in Toronto, and it's uh, the Swedish Canadian Chamber of Commerce, also located in Toronto, and of course the Swedish Embassy here in Ottawa. And we are doing this in cooperation with Natural Resources Canada, CIM, and Epiroc. And I must say it has been a great interest from industry, academia, and government, both in Canada and in Sweden for this webinar. And we are very happy to have each and every one of you with us today for this important discussion. Without further ado, I would like to hand over now to the moderator, Janice Sink, who is the Director for Green Mining Innovation at Natural Resources Canada. Over to you, Janice. Janice, you're muted. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Ala. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We have over 350 people registered from around the globe. We'll see if we actually reach that number today. We have four amazing panelists with you today from Canada and Sweden to talk about this important topic. Before we get started, uh, just a little housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded. And I will ask everyone to please mute their microphones. I'll give a brief introduction on the subject first uh, before introducing our panelists. They will each have five minutes to speak. And then I will go to Dr. Heather Jamieson to give her perspective on teaching in the, the future of mining. And then she will pose the first question. Que la única forma, Mari, que yo Just a reminder to mute your mic, everyone. Um, and then I'd ask uh, everybody who's joining the webinar to please put their questions in the chat box. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible, and then we'll take questions up to about five minutes before the hour. So um, just to give an introduction in terms of the, the, uh, the subject matter, next slide please. Wanted to introduce in terms of four um, main areas. Let's first speak a bit about the green economy uh, and green mining. So we're all aware that the transition to the green economy will require greater supply of minerals and metals. At the same time, there's a greater demand for stronger environmental, social and governance performance. There is a competitive advantage in adopting a green, green mining practices, both from an economic but in a, a sustainable perspective. And to we want to look at building a green and more inclusive economy around the world, especially in Sweden and in Canada. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about women in mining. According to Bloomberg, the proportion of women employed in mining companies is approximately 15.7%. That's up only what 1% in the last five years. And most women are in support functions. There are a low percentage of women at the management level and just one in 20 global firms is headed by a woman. We're lucky to have one with us joining us today. Uh, Canada represents uh, in the mining industry about 70% women and in Sweden doing slightly better with major mining companies approaching one in four women to men ratio. Next slide please. If we look at a, a bit of uh, some statistical information, we can see that women in executive positions has generally stagnated over the last five years or so, around less than 15%. However, interesting to look at mining represent, of gender representation in mining companies at C-suites -suite, around the world. And in some jurisdictions, th things are much better, like in Africa, where we we're almost uh, approaching 25%. Uh, and less is um, progressive in Latin American and the Caribbean countries. Canada and, and Europe are typically around the same areas, around 12%. Next slide, please. So let's look a little bit about gender and sustainable development. Women, as well as men, are drivers for sustainable development. They're advocates for collaboration and they are sustainable consumers. Interesting, greener economies hold great potential to reduce gender inequalities and increase economic participation of women. Research out of the University of Edinburgh suggests, Edinburgh suggests that women have a higher level of socialization to care about others and to be socially responsible, 
which then leads them to care about environmental problems. From Utah, we hear that evidence suggests that femininity and greenness have come to be cognitively linked, which is interesting to our, our discussion today. Next slide, please. So if we look a little bit again, a stat information in terms of uh, gender preferences, we can see that women will be tend to be stronger uh, with interest in terms of the environmental protection. And we also see, interestingly enough, in terms of interest in different um, education fields, women will tend to go more into the social sciences, more into environmental health. Um, and whereas we see much more men uh, dominating in the engineering and STEM fields. Next slide, please. And then let's talk a little about women in innovation. So we all know that diversity and inclusion certainly help to produce a more creative and innovative team. And this often will lead to greater productivity and more profitability. While increasing diversity in general increases performance, there is also evidence that women specifically have made have a major impact on the team. Researchers at MIT and, Cognit and Carnegie Mellon um, sought to identify general intelligence scores of teams. They not only found that teams that included women got better results, but that higher the higher the proportion of women, the better the teams performed. Next slide, please. So just a couple of points for discussion as I pass it over to the panel. Some of the things we're interested to hear about is how are women taking the mining industry in a greener direction? Uh, will opportunities in green mining increase female enrollment in mining and metallurgy? How can Canada and Sweden work together to continue to be at the forefront of mining globally when it comes to technique and standards, values and gender equity? And how can female role models uh, and greater representation make a difference for gender parity? in mining and what can we start doing today to empower gender diversity and the green mining revolution and with that i'd like to pass it over to our first panelists uh, uh we'll be hearing from the swedish state secretary emil hogberg and i'll pass it to him to give the first um, panel remarks thank you very much ladies and gentlemen it's, uh, of course, a very great pleasure for me as a State Secretary at the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation in Sweden to get this opportunity to shortly present our ambitions regarding the topic women's role in the green transformation. As everyone here is aware of, the world is uh, facing a transition from uh, fossil-based energy solutions to new fossil independent and often mineral or metal based solutions. And the mining industry will play, of course, an important role in supplying the raw materials needed for this transition. And at the same time, we need to ensure that the needed mining and recycling is carried out in a sustainable manner. Responsible and sustainable production of metals and minerals is decisive for realizing the UN's global sustainability goals. And in Sweden, we aim to be the world's first fossil free welfare state, and our emissions are to be reduced to net zero within 25 years by 2045 at the latest. And the move to a fossil free state will require increased digitalization, electrification, and automation for reduced emissions and increased efficiency. I would also like to highlight that Sweden is regarded as one of the world's most innovative countries with a focus on co-creation between business, academia and the public sector. And we can contribute to find solutions to our societal challenges and increase our competitiveness in my country as well in partnering countries like Canada. The mining industry in Sweden has a strong commitment to sustainability and an attractive and safe workplace are key elements for the industry in its task to attract and recruit young talented people. And the mining industry in our country has also identified the need to attract more women to their mines and they have realized that more women in mining usually improves the safety culture at the workplaces. The global competition, the new technologies and the demands for efficient and safe production 
mean that the mining industry must attract more people from a broader recruitment base to ensure a more innovative environment. Social sustainable development is about building technology, communities, organizations and clusters where humans are at the center of development and innovation, where no groups are disadvantaged by formal or informal structures. And I have by myself visited uh, mines in Sweden, which are very focused in increasing the proportion of women. The Swedish uh, company Bolinden, for example, currently have about 20% women in the business. By combining automation, continuously developing the working environment and internal recruitment, they hope to come closer to a 50-50 balance. Automation and digitalization contribute to new work environments in the mine, which in themselves require special skills and which attract both men and women. To summarize, I'm happy to be part of this webinar today in order to discuss the way forward for the mining industry regarding the important issue of women's role in green transformation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. We will now pass to uh, Mr. Sean Tupper, the Associate Deputy Minister at Natural Resources Canada. Uh, thank you. Um, Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I sit in Ottawa today. Um, I know I, I'm surprised at how far reaching our conference is. Um, I see hellos from all over the world. Um, I sit here in Ottawa at home, uh, like many of you, I suspect, uh, but in the unceded and traditional territories of the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabeg uh, peoples. Um, these uh, land recognitions uh, are a reflection of Canada's history. Um, they're a reflection a little bit of the discussion we're having today, uh, which speaks to the heart of how we build uh, more diverse and inclusive uh, communities. Um, and I was very pleased to be invited uh, today. Um, they asked me in my speaking notes to think of a personal anecdote to kind of lead off my comments and why uh, this is an important issue for me. And I can truthfully say, uh, I grew up with four sisters, uh, my mother and grandmother, all in the same house. Um, I watched my sisters uh, become professionals and join the energy industry and the banking industry and become geologists and homemakers. And I've watched how you know my career evolved and how their careers evolved, and, and they were different. Um, I don't have to think about getting in a taxi cab alone. I don't have to, you know, think about walking down the street alone, especially if it's dark. Um, I don't think a whole lot about when I walk in a boardroom, how I'll be perceived, but I've witnessed that uh, with my sisters and, 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 and my sisters-in-law. Um, I also was at NRCAN at the start of my career um, and watched um, the first uh, female energy minister be appointed and then have to fight her way into the boardrooms. Uh, into the Petroleum Club in Calgary, uh, which at that time didn't allow women members. Uh, and, and, and she broke those barriers. Uh, needless to say, Pat Carney uh, was the first female member uh, of, of the Petroleum Club. And so um, these are issues I, I have kind of watched uh, all, of, all of my career. Uh, I also pay attention to them because of my own personal experience. I'm a gay man. Um, I have to pay attention or I do pay attention uh, to um, my position within the government and my ability to speak up for diversity as it applies to um, the gay community. Um, and I think there are parallels in terms of some of the challenges um, that uh, all, of, all of our employment equity groups uh, confront. And so um, I have an appreciation, I think, of the struggle that some people confront uh, as they advance their careers. Um, the, the state secretary, I, I think, laid out some really important aspects of this conversation in terms of where this sector is going, the opportunity that the sector has uh, as we think about uh, the shift in technology, uh, the shifts in the way we'll, we'll produce and consume energy, uh, the need for critical uh, minerals and rare earth elements uh, that will be you know, the, 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 the fundamentals, the foundation to our success 
uh, at moving uh, towards net zero and decarbonizing uh, our, our systems. Um, and so we have an opportunity uh, as we think through uh, the growth of the sector and how it can contribute um, that we need to design it in a way. We need to kind of make sure as the industry grows, as our programming grows as a government, um, that we're doing really conscious design um, so that we don't continue to allow barriers to exist. Um, in fact, that we need to break down those barriers that exist uh, to allowing everybody to thrive and everybody uh, to be uh, included. Uh, in our department, we've already begun to take, I think, some really significant um, steps uh, towards supporting gender equality uh, in the mining sector. Uh, we've launched a, a STEM the Gap program uh, that is led by our moderator today, uh, Jana Sink. Uh, it provides re-entry opportunities for women who have left STEM positions in the workforce in the past five years, um, and it's creating opportunities to bring them back in, to give them a, a clear and steady path uh, to rejoin the workforce. Uh, under our Canadian uh, Minerals and Metals Plan, uh, we also uh, have a number of initiatives uh, that are trying to advance women's participation in the industry, which includes uh, an, an initiative from the Producers and Developers Association of Canada, uh, commonly known as PDAC, uh, where they have produced, produced a gender and diversity uh, guide for explorers, uh, which was released in 2019. Um, the Canadians of Mining campaign uh, highlights the variety of individuals and career opportunities in the mining sector with a view to attracting women uh, across Canada uh, into the sector. Um, mining workshops have been run to raise awareness of the, the, the gender equity issues and the gaps that exist, uh, and again, to kind of focus on career awareness and to develop strategies uh, that allow us to uh, establish those partnerships that will be crucial to breaking the barriers. Uh, we paid particular mind uh, to uh, increasing uh, our partnership with Indigenous people in the country and making sure that we're focusing uh, on including Indigenous participation in the sector, uh, perhaps adjusting the way we uh, do procurement, uh, making sure the way we do our business activities um, allow the participation of all Canadians um, and especially Indigenous women. Um, and we are of the view that um, uh, that community can play a bigger role in mining services and supply. Um, and indeed are very active in Canada uh, in this regard. Uh, and finally, our provincial and territorial partners um, are also um, doing a lot of support uh, around nonprofit initiatives um, that focus on women uh, in mining. And, and these are just some of the examples that we've already been doing. Uh, we hope uh, that we'll be able to kind of grow uh, our capacity uh, through the design of new programs that will make sure that we're constantly confronting uh, and, and designing systems um, that are inclusive uh, and that avoid the biases that we sometimes see uh, in our institutions. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll close at that. I'm very excited to be here and to participate in this discussion. Uh, back to you, Janice. Thank you, Sean. Uh, next, we're going to go to the CEO of Epi Rock, Helena Ed Bloom. Um, Helena, over to you. Thank you so much uh, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this event. Uh, so I have more than 20 years experience from the mining OEM side. Uh, I have a passion for innovation uh, and leadership. Uh, and for me, it is very exciting times to be in the mining industry. I started my career 20 years ago developing drilling consumables. Uh, and today I am the CEO of Epiroc. Uh, we are less than three years old as, as an independent company, but at the same time, of course, with a strong heritage uh, from many years within the Atlas Copco group. Uh, so I usually say that we are a 148-year-old uh, startup. You can take next. Uh, so we want to be part uh, of the sustainable society, and we take a pride in driving technology step changes, and we are always focused on what is next, a uh, strong focus on innovation. And it, I would say that it is part of our uh, company DNA. And we are continuously building in creating an innovation culture. And to be successful in this ambition, we need people with different backgrounds, experiences, cultures and gender. gender. Uh, and that is why we have diversity and inclusion so high up on our agenda. To take next. 
So for me, sustainability is a driver for long term growth. Uh, and we want really to enable the transformation of the mining industry to become more sustainable. Uh, and it's clear that our innovation agenda goes hand in hand with our customers sustainability agenda. And last year we set out our path towards 2030 with sustainability goals to support the Paris Agreement, uh, where we commit to in 10 years time halt the CO2 emission from operations, from transports and the products that we sell. Uh, but also we have set high ambitions when it comes to gender diversity. You can take next. So our ambition is to double the number of women in operational roles uh, by 2030 and to have 40% women managers in the company. And to me, this is all about having the leadership needed in a fast changing world. We are in, in the middle of a number of technology shifts. It is automation, digitalization and electrification. And inclusivity and gender is one key part needed to succeed, to stay ahead. And of course, half of the talent pool is women. And if we are not successful to attract these women, we will miss out. So we are fully committed to, to this journey in the coming years. If you take next. So a few words then on the technology shifts that are now shaping our industry. Automation makes it possible to remove people from the dangerous areas. Digitalization makes make the whole process more safer and more efficient. And if we then combine it with electrification, we improve the working environment uh, as well as with the re we reduce the CO2 emission. So we invest more than we have ever done in R&D to drive these changes. Uh, and I believe you know, that the mining industry is becoming a high tech industry. And I see that women can really contribute to this development. If you take next. I will continue a bit on electrification. So we have battery electric vehicles now in all parts of the world uh, with a large offering. And we also support other OEMs to use our battery technology. We have developed battery as a service to lower the threshold for our customers to join us on this journey. And together with a partner in Canada, we will soon also launch retrofit capabilities to transform the existing fleet of machines out there into battery technology. Take next. And it all started in Canada. Our first battery products was developed, built and deployed in Canada 2013. They were part of our generation one. And since then we have more than 100,000 hours on these machines. And now we have our new generation ready with our mid-size battery electrical vehicles, 14 ton loaders and 42 ton trucks. And Canada continue to be the country leading the way we signed our first battery as a service contract in Canada last year, and soon the conversion kits for our ST1030 loader will be ready, as well as we're developing trolley solutions for, for trucks. We will also soon establish a competence center for electrification in Canada to help drive this technology shift in the rest of the world. You take next. So today, the volume of battery machines are, of course, only a small portion of all the machines that we sell. But we are optimistic and we have, we have proven that we can do this and we will continue to develop our offering. So we aim to offer a full range of emission free products by 2030 for both surface and underground mining. And underground, we aim even higher. Already 2025, we have committed to have a full range of emission free products. So we are fully committed to drive this change in the industries that we serve. If you take next. So our focus in the coming years will be on diversity and inclusion and a strong focus on innovation and sustainability. And that is how we secure that we will be an employer of choice uh, with an organization that is future proof and with products and solutions that will enable the green transformation in the mining industry. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Helena. Uh, and then to our final panelist, uh, Samantha Espley. She is the president of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum. Over to you, Samantha. Good morning, afternoon, everyone around the world. Uh, really great to have you all here with us uh, for this very important conversation. I want to thank our organizers and, of course, Janice for moderating. Really insightful uh, input already from my my fellow colleagues, Emil, Sean, Helena. Thank you for that, and I'll and I'll do my bit to add to it. I. I've had the good fortune actually to work with uh, all kinds of mining companies and businesses around the world. And I, I was fortunate to go to Sweden a couple of years ago and I visited Epi Rock. <laughs> I was looking at the 40V, the mechanical rock excavator that you're, you're developing for the industry. And besides the ingenuity of the team, I was really impressed when I looked out the window and I saw the bike rack was full of bikes and this was February it was snowing outside so uh, a lot of fortitude and, and ingenuity uh, with our Swedish folks and uh, thank you for for bringing those technologies to the to the industry I'm really quite impressed and I'm impressed with our, our conversation today uh, in terms of the expectations for me for you uh, is just if you know these are my insights these are my thoughts and I, I think we just, you know, we're we're trying to share and figure our way forward for a, a sustainable and increasingly sustainable future for our industry and for our planet. And uh, I just ask that you listen objectively, maybe consider your role in this transition in the industry and, you know, sort of get out of the stands and get on the field <laughs> with us and help make this happen. Um, in the next slide, I, I just want to show a little bit of um, history. And so, you know, when I first started in the industry in 1988, I, you know, I was, I, I was perplexed. Why are there not very many women in this industry? And when I looked back at the history, at least in Canada, you can see that there were um, there were laws in place, uh, quite frankly, that prevented women from working in the mines because, you know, it's too strenuous, it's too dangerous, et cetera. And it wasn't until 1960 that women could start to work in the surface operations in mines. And then in 1978, uh, when the legislation again changed and allowed women to work underground. So when you look at um, those changes, you can see why there's not a lot of women, not a lot of role models, and that is starting to transition and change now. I know even in terms of legislation for women on boards, um, you know, Quebec is sort of leading the way in Canada and has new legislation requiring um, uh, some parity of women on boards. And you're starting to see, um, uh, like the Canadian uh, Securities Agency, they're, you know, asking for disclosure of who is on the board of, of these mining companies. And it is starting to change again a shift and you're seeing a lot of women now have qualifications and interests in these areas and are able to to come into the industry and represent particularly in the sustainability field is is what I'm seeing and hearing about so I just wanted to keep that in perspective and and as Janice uh, showed already if you look on the next slide it's sort of um, Samantha Cad here where you know history of workers in Canada you can see how women have slowly um, taking up roles uh, outside the home and uh, how the women in mining is is slowly creeping up over the years and I and I think you know as you see more and more women in the industry and a little more commonplace when, when you're talking around the dinner table at night about mining industry for men Men and women, uh, there, these opportunities are beginning going to be more apparent for children to think about as future careers. If we move to the next slide, I just wanted to say there's a lot of outreach now. So this is taken right off of the Mining Association of Canada's website, and these women here, um, I, you know, myself there as well, are either are, are mostly in uh, say indigenous focus, human resources, as well as sustainability focus, and, and a couple of us uh, that have. Um, the operating technical background as well. And so, you know, I, I think that's really great that we're starting to share that type of information um, with each other um, and, and encouraging women and men to think about the mining industry for very valuable uh, careers. If we move to the next slide, um, I just, you know, this is a really, we're talking about green mining, and this is a really interesting report I always look at every year. It comes out from Ernst & Young. This is Paul Mitchell. He's one of the leaders there. And always does a survey of the industry to understand what are the risks and opportunities and in, in the mining industry. And you can see number one there is licensed to operate. And so... Um, 
a lot of the uh, focus there is is in this area. It is a risk and an opportunity, uh, one that all of us on this call can can work towards finding solutions. And I and I you know my my little bullets at the bottom those those aren't Paul's, but I would like you know us to think about what's causing that that you know that pressure on the license to operate is really around the increasing legislation requirements, uh, society, the voice of society, and indigenous groups, communities where we operate, and urban centers that have a per perception of the mining industry and how do we change that and make it more responsible and work together, as well as investors and the cons um, customers at the end of the day are looking for green mining companies to put their money into and they want to buy green products from the mining industry. In fact, if you go to the next slide, I just want to say most recently, you know, you've got CEOs out there pledging to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. They want to achieve net, you know, carbon zero by, you know, some target dates, 2050, 2040, whatever they are. And then you've got, you know, people like Elon Musk, who's promising to give contracts to those those mining companies that are green, that are responsible miners. And so this is really a shift in the world that we're seeing and a, and a role for men and women uh, to, to take us on this journey. If we go to the next slide. Um, you know, green is, is not just about carbon, and we're talking about uh, sustainability right across the board here. Here's some interesting photos from Valley Archives, uh, where, where I spent a, a good part of my career, and, and a lot of the re-greening efforts in, a, in an old industrial site in Sudbury. And, you know, we're addressing soil, water, air. We're talking about building up biodiversity and protecting land. Reducing waste is a huge area, trying to reduce how much fresh water we're bringing in and how much we're discharging back to the environment, um, you know, eliminating tailings and, and slag piles, like one of the images there, the re-greening efforts. And, and it's more than just the land and the, and the land and the fish and, and, and the bees and things. It's also about people and our mental health and well-being. And, and that includes uh, the people in this industry and those in and around it and, and the Indigenous communities as well. If we go to the next slide. Um, you know, so what have I done? <laughs> you know, as a, a very passionate person in the mining industry, I, I created this, um, I'd say last year sometime, it's called the whole mine approach. And I, I really wanted to put a thought piece together for industry to think about, you know, think about how we're designing the mines of the future. I talk about mining, the, designing the mines of 2030, but designing it for tomorrow. And so future proofing, putting things into your designs today that will allow that green, sustainable, ever increasing responsibility of the industry to allow us to achieve it. So these are just my thoughts. I, I put in a couple of the, the thought pieces. It's got 10 elements to it, but let me just go through a couple really quickly here. If you, you know, if we talk about our mining methods, we've been designing the same mines, you know, for, for the last 50 years, um, pretty much carbon copy, um, cut and paste. You know, let's rethink it, engineer out the hazards that are in those mining methods that we have used forever and, and come up with innovative, high productive methods, low carbon methods of moving material, of processing material, even the layouts, how optimized are we, you know, reducing the amount of waste um, that we create, tunnels that aren't really there for any purpose, um, uh, you know, really rethinking, even thinking about our underground warehousing and magazine storages, get rid of them, use, you know, um, Amazon <laughs> style of delivery systems to bring our products underground when we need it um, to the right to the face. If you look at the next slide, some other sort of thought provoking um, aspects as Helena has already talked about, we're looking about electrification because we have green hydro electricity and we can use that to replace fossil fuel driven equipment. So going to electric fleets makes sense, particularly in many places in Canada. Um, alternative power generation, if you are in remote areas, we're looking at wind, we're looking at solar, we're looking at small modular reactors. This is the way to go uh, to, to reduce our footprint in the world. If you look to the next slide, when we talk about continuous processes, there's all kinds of new technology and new equipment coming on the scene. Everything from the the, the, the machines at, at, at EpiRock to platooning machines, even getting away from um, mechanical equipment and, and looking at conveyors such as a railway or Makahai, very novel conveyances and, and systems to move material, massive amounts of material at very low cost and carbon reduction um, focused. 
And then finally, I, you know, I talk about waste reduction here. Um, we need to do everything we can. There's brand new technology coming out in Canada that uses ion exchange in a, in a closed loop process, continuous process. We have a hydraulic air compressor that was built in, and established here in Sudbury, uh, producing compressed air very, very um, efficiently and, and, and low carbon, as well as all kinds of focus. Even in, in Brazil, I know they're looking at commercializing waste streams to eliminate the, the, the waste that we produce from mining. Um, you know, I'll just close off uh, in terms of my whole mind that it really takes all of us. We need to work together a common vision, shared responsibility, a shared accountability, and a shared investment. If we're putting in a, a, a brand new power station for a remote mine somewhere, why are we not looking at something that is shared with the community to support all of us uh, powering hospitals and schools and, and the community as well as the operation? So that, that's really the whole mine, a couple elements there and, and the role that women and men play in bringing those technologies to our industry to help make this vision possible. I would say, you know, ESG, the environmental social governance, it's it's a top priority in mining. I say is rapidly becoming, I, I really think we're there. Men and women, all stakeholder groups, we, we're attracted to these roles. We all want to do our part. We want to do our, our best in the environment in bringing societal rights, human rights, land use, um, and also on the governance end of things, you know, a, an end to bribery and corruption and have tra transparency and legal compliance. I think we all want that. It's There's a role for all of us. Um, I really uh, I really think it's a, 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 the way of the future. Now, I just want to close by by thanking everyone again for being part of this, um, this movement, this conversation today and continuing uh, to move towards an ever increasingly sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, I've been, um, a lot of amazing information has come out of each of the presentations, uh, and I think lots of directions where we can take this conversation. We've also been monitoring the chat, uh, some interesting uh, almost debates, some information being shared. And before we go to questions, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Uh, Heather Jamison from Queen's University to come on, uh, and she's going to um, share a little bit of information about how rec you know, she's re recruiting, uh, you know, I guess gender diversity and diversity in general and uh, in the mining sector. And she's going to pose a question to our panelists. Heather, over to you. Thank you, Janice. Um, yes, I'm a professor in the geology department at a university in Canada, and I actually uh, lead a research program on uh, environmental impact of mining uh, critical metals and green metals. Um, and we teach in our department, we teach two streams, those going on to a degree in geological sciences and those in geological engineering. And when I looked over the numbers, our representation of women students is actually quite healthy. It's, it's between 50 and 75% in, in both uh, streams. In fact, last year our geological engineering grads at the undergrad level uh, were 77 percent women um, out of about 30 students. Um, at the graduate level it's around 45 percent and faculty were just under 50 percent right now after some recent hirings. But it's important and, and well first of all I'd say that we're, we're actually now very focused on uh, diversifying our students. We would li really like to attract more Indigenous students. I appreciated Sean Tupper's uh, comments in that uh, area, it's extremely important, and and more students from racialized groups. But our program prepares people uh, for careers in more than mining, right? They go through geology, they may work in, in a number of areas. So I reached out to my colleagues in the mining department at Queen's. We have a vigorous undergrad program in mining engineering, and several of them are here on the call. And then their numbers are somewhat lower. They have at the undergrad level 25% uh, uh, women students, uh, although that's a, a sharp increase from, from previous years. And at the graduate level, uh, about 17% women students. So when we conferred about this, my colleagues in mining and I, we, we uh, decided that the question we'd like to pose to the panels is how do you specifically attract uh, students to programs that's going to prepare them for a career in mining. Thanks, Heather. Um, would anyone like to to answer Heather's question first off, or shall I just? 
point a virtual finger. Maybe I can start. Uh, no, but I think we have, I will say, I think we have a great opportunity now with all the technology shifts uh, happening, you know. So I think we need together to position the industry as a high tech industry that is, is vital for the, for the green transformation long term for the world. Uh, and, and I think we, I think we need, you know, I think we need to work on the image for, you know, uh, from the, for the industry in, in general. Uh, to attract more women. Uh, for me, that is, um, and, and that's a work that we, you know, work that we need to share all, all of us together because uh, I still see that that is, is the, the main reason why, also why, you know, women that has gone to these educations and up outside our industry, uh, you know, which is also a pity, you know. So I, I think we really, the, 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 I think we need to work together to set, let's we'll say, position the industry as a high-tech industry moving forward, because it is, it is. <laughs> yeah, mm. Andrew from Sweden here, I totally agree with, with Helena here. The, that, the work that had, that had, when we have moved from zero, almost zero to 20% women, autom automation and developing the working environment and digitization, that will work to create the 50-50 balance as well. So we, we are on our way. I think I, I think part of the part of the challenge though is 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 where do you start in terms of trying to create the mindset that allows women to, to understand that, that that there is a choice. And and for us in the department, we're starting to think um, that it, it's not sufficient to kind of uh, just focus on women who are already in engineering or in the industry. We've, we've got to get to youth. We've, we've got to kind of create a mindset that, that, that builds that awareness that you can choose to go into political science, you can choose to go into engineering, you can choose to go into chemistry, and we've got to make sure those doorways are open to everybody. And so some of the things that we're, we're thinking about uh, right across the natural resources sector, so forestry, energy, and mining, uh, is to, to, to really focus on um, getting to, to, to youth before they go to university, making sure that they have a sense of, of kind of what those opportunities are uh, and that they understand the choices that they have. And I, and I think starting that early is what really gives us that long-term dividend that, that we'll see more women represented across uh, academia and, and as a consequence available to kind of enter into the workforce and, and, and join business. Mm -hmm. If I can chime in as well, I, you know, I'm really proud of the CIM in particular. We've got tremendous outreach and, and uh, I really want to reach society and, and talk about the benefits, essential services and, and products that the mining industry provides to society. And, and part of that, we're actually creating a digital game. <laughs> so we're going to reach a created game that's very much aligned with the curriculum in Canada and uh, target children, obviously, and talk about mining and all the great things in the mining industry as well. You know, this would probably be fun for anybody, any age, right? So, you know, doing things like that, I think, is a way to help change the perception of the industry. And like you said, Alina, you know, this is about technology and, and it's not so much physical labor anymore, right? And uh, depending on the job, but, it, you know, there are many opportunities in, in the industry for men and women to join. And, and I think that is the key message. That's to me is the underlying message. How do you reach all of those children and allow that at least Make it a choice. Make it an awareness, right? That, to me, is the fundamental uh, where we need to start. Thanks very much, panelists. Um, I'm going to build on that question from Heather with another question from Professor Barry Hassani from McGill University. And he wants to know if there's anything or if there's any incentives from government or industry that can be put in place to really to attract more females to our industry. So I'm going to maybe kick that over to uh, maybe Helena first, and then I'm going to ask... Um, maybe Sean or Emil to, to jump in there as well. You know, to my knowledge, there are no incentives, uh, you know, in Sweden, uh, you know, so not that I'm aware of. Maybe, I mean, if you have a better understanding, but, um, you know, but I, but I share that view, Samantha, that you, we need to start early. You know, it's, it's kind of too late when you are 15, 16, it must start much earlier to bring more the interest for technology must start very early. Um, from government representatives, are there any incentives that you're aware of to be able to attract women into uh, mining related professions? 
or in our studies? No, I don't think there are any direct incentives in that way that you that you asked. No, we don't. I don't think so. I, yeah, incentives in in that strict sense of the word, I, I'd say not. But I I do think um, the reference to ESG is important. Um, I, I think increasingly as we think about, for instance, in, at NRCAN, um, how are we designing new programs? Um, are we imposing into those programs obligations to have representation from racialized minorities to make sure that you've got a certain percentage of, of women and, and, and whatnot? I think that those are ways uh, that we will incent people um, to, to, to kind of think about these issues and, and perhaps act differently. And so those are things uh, as we, um, you know, to, to get the pat phrase, building back better, um, those, those are, I, I think, advantages that we can now start designing into the work we're doing um, so that we, we ensure that, that people are, are, are thinking about these issues at, at, at the front end. Thank you, Samantha? Yeah, Jan Janice, I could just jump in as well. I was just thinking about, you know, on the industry side, there's, you know, some really interesting leaders out there who work with the community to allow some training, some pre-training, so that when the job postings come up, these um, individuals have the pre-qualifications to allow them to start to work. So I know, um, you know, Anna Tudela, you know, she she comes to mind. So doing those types of outreach and sort of preparing um, people so that they're ready for the industry is also, you know, a, a reducing the barriers that exist there. And I, and I think Mir, you, you talked a little bit about them, the Mining Industry Human Resource uh, Consortium Group. They we have uh, some really neat tools that allow companies like Mosaic. I know they did some work on this. They look at job titles. They look at you know they look at what are the barriers in their business that they can they can remove to help to attract and retain women in the mining industry. So you know I think there's there are some uh, tools out there to help at least identify maybe unconscious biases and things like that, you know, getting rid of, you know, some of those old titles, for example, sounds pretty simple, but it, it actually is a bit of a, a disincentive to the industry. So uh, yeah, I think there there's that. I, know, I, I think you were talking or Ferry was talking more about monetary, but I, I do think there's, you know, the, all these other aspects that need to be considered as well. Thanks, thanks, Samantha. Um, another question I'm going to maybe pose to the panel is um, we certainly had some comments on the chat about, you know, that there are roles and, and panelists have said this as well, roles for men and women in the grand, green transformation. So I'm going to, and then I think there was another comment in the chat about, you know, what are the barriers to women? Because sometimes they're not obvious to men uh, that there are any, and the, and the reason that women are not, are not entering the workforce. Although Sean did allude to the fact many of these, these barriers that, that are faced, sometimes um, invisible barriers, and I think the comment earlier about, you know, biases, maybe are not um, being aware, self-aware of biases. So maybe I'm going to go to Emil to maybe comment on some of those pieces. Thank you very much. You asked uh, what barriers we have to focus on f first. And I think we have addressed some of them during the session here, the tradition and the image of, of the sector, and uh, maybe also uh, and, and the image of uh, a very um, male dominated sector that many are afraid of discrimination and and even uh, sometimes uh, harassment and, and uh, even worse and of course that's that's uh, a fact that all over the world that women continue to suffer from from discrimination and violence and we we must work in all our society to to face those issues and work with gender equality because it's of course a fundamental human right and from our side we keep trying express and and demand to see it applied by all means uh, not only in sweden but also through our uh, foreign policy our feminist foreign policy that we work with so maybe that image of the sector is also maybe a part of the problem thank you um, and I think some of you are referring to the barriers as maybe disincentives. Uh, any any others that we would like to to share? Would you somebody like to jump in? 
I, I can offer a perspective. I, w- I will say that, you know, when I started in the industry 30 years ago, uh, the industry wasn't ready for women at the time, and so we didn't have like dry facilities, something as simple as that, a change room, right? So I didn't have the right size boots, I didn't have the right size clothes, you know. So a lot of that is gone, uh, Janice. A lot of those barriers are, are are just not there anymore. And and kudos to the mining industry for making the transitions. I think something that came across really clearly through a survey that we did a few years ago was that a lot of women feel very alone. And you know, if you can create some sort of network so that they can talk about some of their challenges and issues and what do you do about childcare and things like, you know, real, real real concerns that they have when they enter into an industry, no matter which industry, it's a it's a great chance for them to talk to each other and support one another. So I, I would say mentoring and having networks is is a, an opportunity uh, to, to um, at least, uh, you know, find support for one another. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah. Hey, if I can also comment, I think I think what we can do as an industry, I think we, you know, if we focus on on leadership to have strong leaders in our industry that are was it open minded and are prepared to work with the company cultures, because in my view that is very much the the you know the the challenge I think that we 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 are all facing, and, and make sure that we bring all bring everyone with us, especially the leaders, because the leaders must be open-minded to, to facilitate this change. Uh, otherwise, it's the, the easy way is, of course, to, to you know, continue as is. Uh, so I think it boils down to, to brave leaders. Um, yeah, yeah, and I definitely agree with that. And, and to build on that point and, and some of the uh, comments in the chat, and then I'll maybe take this over, ask Sean of this question, and, and certainly everybody else is happy to jump in, is what is the role of a mentor or mentors in kind of building um, more gender parity in the sector? Those mute buttons are tricky these days. Um, the role of the mentor, I, I, I mean, I think I mean, I, I think first and foremost, it, it's about being available and it's about being there to speak up and to address the challenges and to acknowledge those things. I think I think that it, it's it's really critical that that leaders um, make themselves and and, and indeed it, within the public service, I've played a very active role as a coach and a mentor within the public service. I actually see that as part of my job. I don't think that's something I, I do because I like it or I do because it's on the corner of my desk. I, I think it's a fundamental aspect of being a leader in the public service. Um, and, I, and I think in terms of breaking down the barriers, the one thing I hope people get from, from their interactions with me as a, as a, as a coach and a mentor is is that they get the, the the benefit of 35 years of experience in the public service that I can help them through. We can talk out challenges. We can talk out problems. We can talk about their insecurities and kind of compare notes. And um, and and I think that experience matters, right? Like the people people bringing real life experience and helping others work through those challenges hopefully makes that easier. And 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 I that's a simple answer in a sense, but I I think that's really at the the nub of it in, in terms of what a good coach and mentor can do. Thanks, Sean. Um, I see that we're really we're approaching the hour and we uh, the top of the hour. We, we're running out of time. There's so much to chat about and discuss. So um, before I do a little quick wrap up, I'm going to ask each one of you to very quickly in less than a minute, less than a minute, let's say 15 seconds, give maybe the your personal priority or your corporate or um, organizational priority in order to, um, you know, look at and help the transformation, the green transformation, the inclusion of women and the inclusion of, you know, a diverse workforce. So I'm going to start um, with Samantha. Okay. Well, I, I shared a lot of my vision, Janice. It's called the whole mine approach. Check it out. There's a website. There's there's uh, information there. I really think it's about technology working together and and tackling this thing head on, um, encouraging all men and women to to get on board, get on the field, get out of the stands. Let's make this happen. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, Emil, parting remarks. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'm sure that well-educated women can really make the difference when it comes to reforming the mining and change from business as usual to low carbon and low waste 
circular and resource efficient activities. Uh, I, I'm not sure that women are more engaged or motivated, but I know that they are. So I hope that. Excellent, thank you. Helena. Uh, I, mean, I really would like to say to make a difference. Uh, and uh, I think we have the chance now with the technology shift focus on, on innovation, sustainability, and diversity inclusion. Uh, that will be my top priorities in the coming years. Thank you. And Sean, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I personally made a huge commitment um, within the public service and at our department in, in terms of advancing diversity and inclusion. I'm the champion um, for that work in the department. Um, and I think one of the things I really pushed on in, in the public policy context is, is making sure we think beyond just the issue of the day. It, it's not just about um, technology. It's about how technology can be used to benefit Canadians. So it's not that it makes a more efficient mine. It is because it creates, you know, uh, robotics and, 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 and automation allow women to do jobs that they previously perhaps weren't able to do. And so making people think bigger, connecting more dots as, as, as we advance our work, that's to me the thing that will really see results in the end. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to all our panelists. I mean, this has been a very exciting uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think one that we could continue in a, for many, many, many hours. Um, what did we hear today? We heard a lot about how important it is for both men and women to be part of the green transformation, and that the green transformation includes minerals and metals, but also how we extract the minerals and metals. We learned a lot about how important technology is, how electrification and how this will change the workforce in general, it'll help to diversify the workforce. It's important also to keep in mind, um, you know, incentives to be able to attract a diverse workforce, but also to look at the disincentives and to be aware of those and to be aware of maybe some invisible biases that may be present at all times. So um, with that, I mean, as I said, we could go on uh, for quite a while. I'd like to thank very much um, our panelists I'd like to thank um, all of our uh, our audience members that have joined. I certainly certainly like to start to thank Team Sweden, and I'm going to pass it over to Christina for concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Christina Kieran, and I'm the country manager at uh, Business Sweden here in Canada. And uh, I would like to express a deep thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, it has been a really interesting webinar. And judging from our chat room, there has been a ton of conversation. People are answering uh, other people's questions, and it's really good to see. And I think you have all shown a great leadership, uh, all of the speakers in on this topic. Uh, it is something that is very, uh, very important, not just for the mining industry, Industry, but also for other sectors. Um, uh, I just wanted also to mention that we will continue this dialogue. We will continue uh, uh, promoting gender equality and diversity. And um, uh, our next event is actually happening next week uh, during the PDAC. We have a Nordic Mining Day next Friday where we will talk about the uh, investment opportunities in the Nordic region, um, Sweden, Finland and Norway. And for those who are interested in, in that topic, you can contact me and, and I can make sure to invite you. It's a, a free uh, digital event. So thank you so much for joining us today.